Welcome to all of you who are just joining us right now. Just hang tight for a little bit. Uh, we're going to wait until um, everyone is logged on and then we'll get started. All right, for those of you who are just joining us right now, I guess I was muted, um, please hang tight. Um, we are just uh, giving everyone a chance to get online and then we'll go ahead and get started. For those of you just joining us, uh, please hang on just for another minute. We'll give people maybe one more minute to, to log on and then we'll go ahead and get started. Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Hillary Godwin, Dean of the UW School of Public Health, and welcome to this special virtual town hall for SBH alumni and friends. Um, today, we're delighted to share with you um, some information about how the school has responded to the COVID-19 outbreak, um, both regionally and in our state, and, uh, and globally as well. Um, in addition to sharing our insights on uh, the overall public health response to the pandemic, um, we are going to be have an open session for answering questions at the end. Um, so um, feel free to pose questions. I'll give you a little bit of information in just a second about how to do that. But before we get there, I'd like to um, give a land acknowledgement. Um, even though we aren't on campus today, um, we still um, I am still on Coast Salish land. I'm guessing many of you are as well. Um, and so we'd like to acknowledge the Coast Salish peoples of this land and the land that touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Duquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. I'd also like to give you a little introduction to um, the panelists who are gonna be joining us today. The first of these is Janet Baseman, who's our Associate Dean for Public Health Practice and Professor of Epidemiology. Next, we have Lisa Manhart, Associate Dean for Research and Professor of Epidemiology. And then last but not least, Stephanie Farquhar, our Acting Associate Dean for Education and Clinical Professor in Health Services and DEOHS. So just a couple of housekeeping things before um, we dig into stuff. Um, for, as you can see on this informational um, slide that we have up, 
Um, we don't use the chat box other than for sometimes people will want to put up a link that they want to share with everybody. The chat box will stay up for the whole time. So if there's something like that that you want to share, you can put it, uh, use the chat box for that function. But for questions and answers, we use the Q&A function, um, which you can see down in the bottom of your screen. Um, so, and when you put in a question, um, if it's for one of the specific panelists, please, uh, please be sure to indicate uh, which panelist you'd like it to be referred to. If you don't, not a big deal. I'll just uh, take my best guess at who's um, the appropriate person to answer it. Um, and then in general, I just want to let people know, um, because it's a little different, we don't use the hand raising function um, for this. Um, we use the Q&A function instead. So um, if there's something urgent that you need to get our attention, you can always put that either in the Q&A or in the chat function. I wanted to give a, a big thanks to our Grayson Society members who are joining us today and all the donors um, to our school. We're so grateful for your partnership. And we realize now more than ever how important it is to support the next generation of public health experts to ensure a prepared and skilled public health workforce. And we appreciate all that you're doing to help support us um, in that. Um, I also want to give a shout out to our alumni. We have uh, many alumni who have been on the front lines of the pandemic, working for public health agencies, for hospitals and clinics, or conducting critical research. Um, if you are one of those folks, we want to hear your story. So if you're able, um, please send your brief stories about how your work has been going um, to us. And um, there's a link on our alumni page, um, and hopefully uh, one of my fellow panelists will put that link up in the, the chat function um, where you can um, share your story. Um, and there also will be a link in a follow-up email that'll go up um, after tonight's event. Um, we'd love to be able to share your stories with our school community um, across our various social media channels and uh, really, you know, want to be able to celebrate everything that you're doing um, as part of uh, our, our legacy of uh, building a public health workforce. Um, this has just been an incredibly tough time for so many people. Um, you know, besides the obvious of, of um, difficulties associated with sheltering in place, um, I hear from people um, regularly who have lost loved ones um, or who are just worried about loved ones who are sick. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just a very difficult time with a lot of uncertainty that we're all facing. And so I just wanted to mention that our hearts go out to all of you who have lost loved ones or friends or family um, have been ill um, or who have otherwise been severely affected by the pandemic um, and, and recognize that that um, has been overwhelmingly um, just a, a huge burden borne by our society. We're also starting to see big economic impacts um, and I'm sure in the months to come um, we'll be seeing more of that as well. As of today, um, more than 4.1 million total confirmed cases of COVID-19 have been reported worldwide, with global deaths surpassing um, 284,000. Nationally in the United States, more than 1.3 million cases have been reported and more than 80,000 deaths. Here in the state of Washington, we're now at about 17,000 confirmed cases of COVID-19, including more than 930 fatalities. Um, we've actually had a pretty robust testing um, system in place, um, particularly in recent weeks. So uh, close to 250,000 tests um, for COVID-19 have been run here in Washington state. So, um, and only 6.8% um, of those have been positive. Uh, that's much better than in some other regions, but we still have quite a bit of work to do to bring up our testing capacity um, to where we would like it to be. Uh, it's been about five weeks since the state hit its peak day for deaths. That was April 5th. Um, I think all of us can appreciate that the, the decline has been much um, more shallow than we thought it was going to be, um, or at least that I thought it was be, going to be, probably some modelers out there, but thinking we knew that. <laughs> um, but um, the shape of the curve has been very different than it was in uh, other parts of the world. Um, and so, we're still in Washington State in a sort of gradual decline, 
Um, that being said, the number of patients that are hospitalized at the UW Medicine Facilities has dropped by half um, from its peak with um, 59 patients as of Friday. So that's really good news for us. Um, nonetheless, um, we're still in a pretty precarious state um, as evidenced by a slight uh, rise in transmission rates. Um, just in the last couple of days, we're no longer um, below um, an R naught of 1.0. So that's, that's concerning. Um, that's data coming or modeling coming from the Institute for Disease Modeling in Bellevue. Um, so some update, other updates. Um, Governor Inslee extended his stay home, stay healthy order um, for us here in Washington state. It's now going through May 31st. Um, but he has started to lift some restrictions on um, specific sectors of the economy, and several of our rural counties in Washington have been authorized to reopen early. So that's exciting. Um, Governor Inslee also um, has announced a four-phase gradual reopening plan, um, uh, which is really interesting. If you haven't taken a look at it, you should definitely check it out. Um, you know, I've I've mentioned this to my internal community a lot, but I want to make sure that I mention um, to our broader U, um, UW SPH community, we're just super fortunate in the state of Washington and in um, Seattle and King County to have elected officials who work so closely hand in hand with um, our great public health leadership um, who are fantastic. We have one of the best local health departments and a totally awesome State Department of Health, um, and it's just such a pleasure to be in an area where the elected officials uh, talk to those folks on a daily basis and listen to the recommendations. And so the phase that Inslee has rolled out is very informed by good public health practices. Um, one of the sort of things that's still in the works is trying to figure out what are the metrics that we're going to use to determine that they're, they is going to use to determine whether or not we move from one phase to the next. Um, so he has indicated that we'll be at each phase for a minimum of three weeks. Um, so for that puts us at the earliest um, switching into phase two in early June. Um, but uh, we're still waiting on some more details to come out from our, our practice partners and uh, Governor Inslee's office um, to find out exactly um, whether there are other metrics that they're going to be watching for as well. Okay, so although I should say uh, DOH, Public Health Seattle, King County, and Inslee's office all have great dashboards that are up right now, so those are a, another great resource to check out if you um, haven't been tracking them. Um, disappointingly, as it's been reported in many parts of the United States, we're starting to see um, racial disparities in terms of who's being impacted by COVID-19. Um, in King County, there are reports that Hispanics have been hospitalized at four times the rate of whites and have experienced a death rate that's two and a half times that for whites. And this is data according to Public Health Seattle and King County, which has a really nice um, extra dashboard that's um, focusing on disparities um, in COVID-19, um, as is the case for um, pretty much all um, uh, such statistics like this as pointing to um, upstream determinants of health um, and social inequities that are resulting in these um, disparities that we're seeing between different racial groups. It's a good reminder to us um, that even at this time when we're really focused on responding to a pandemic, that we can't lose sight of our long-term goal of making sure that we're addressing um, these underlying social inequities that are driving big health disparities. Um, I'd like to um, next sort of tell you a little bit about what we've been doing here um, in the School of Public Health at UW. As you'll probably recall, the first identified case of the virus in um, the United States occurred in Washington State on January 20th. Um, subsequently, we found out that there were earlier cases in other states, but that was the first one that was reported. Um, and then uh, in mid-February, the school sponsored um, with the Meta Center for Pandemic Preparedness and Global Health Security and the Department of uh, Global Health, a forum um, that uh, included representatives from state and local health agencies, include, uh, included physicians, including the one who treated that first case, um, and then, of course, 
um, leaders from uh, the Meta Center as well. Um, and that, at least for me, was a very sort of pivotal moment when I realized that we really needed to shift gears internally um, within the school to make sure that we were getting uh, ready and to be and prepared um, to deal with um, what was likely to be community transmission. And sure enough, the following week we saw um, in the state of Washington and also in um, California and Oregon as well, the first reported cases of community transmission in the United States. So, um, but pretty much simultaneous with um, those first emerging cases, um, we started working with our um, practice partners. Um, so Associate Dean Janet Baseman is going to tell you about some of that work um, that uh, has been done with local health um, uh, agencies. And um, so as part of that, she readied her student epidemic action leaders or SEALs team um, to provide surge support, um, even just for in that very early phase, um, tracking people who are coming in um, from regions that had um, high amounts of infection early on and tracking um, what was going on with them, monitoring their symptoms. Um, and they've been um, a constant presence um, throughout the um, filling in different roles um, since then. Um, internally within the school, um, starting right after we had, uh, right around the time that we started seeing community transmission, um, we reached out and surveyed staff and faculty um, about their ability to work remotely, um, which meant that when we got to the point where um, we needed folks to work remotely, um, that actually most of our folks were already set up and doing so because we had it optional first and then uh, were prepared when it was required. Um, and it meant that we were able to make sure that everyone had the technical fixes that they needed for the most part. Um, we also surveyed researchers to determine how their work would be impacted um, and rolled out some measures there. And probably um, the most difficult and, tra and traumatic part of it was preparing to shift courses online, um, which eventually um, we had to do um, uh, across the board at the University of Washington for the very end of winter quarter and then the beginning of spring quarter. And I'm sure Stephanie is gonna tell us more about that. Um, a number of us in the school have played um, and continue to play leadership roles at the university in responding to the COVID crisis. Um, I'm on the campus-wide um, uh, crisis management team that meets every morning by Zoom. Um, Janet's on our campus advisory committee for communicable diseases that advises the president on um, recommendations for how to respond and how to implement um, practices here at UW. And um, Nicole Eret, who's um, one of our faculty in DEOHS, um, has also um, been critical in terms of incident response and representing uh, the research community, and the list goes on and on. Um, we've worked really hard, both within the school and then um, on a campus level as well, to really try to align our communications and planning with the recommendations of our local public health practice partners um, at both Public Health Seattle and King County and at Washington State Department of Health. Um, and I want to give a huge, huge shout out to the leadership teams there and the folks who are on the front lines every day. You guys have been doing an amazing job, um, both in terms of getting us ready and then responding um, in a great way and messaging really well to our um, communities. Um, we've seen much better um, public compliance with um, the stay home, stay healthy order than um, we've seen in other states. And you guys are doing a fantastic job and, and helping to motivate all of us to uh, flatten the curve. In terms of practice, outreach, and service, our faculty and students have been active in the practice community, um, as they always are, assisting with the response and providing public health resources to help keep communities safe. Um, in addition to, um, I mentioned uh, Dr. Basement and uh, the SEAL team, but also Betty Beckmeyer, who many of you know, and the Northwest Center for Public Health Practice, um, received a grant to rapidly develop an online training module for contact tracing um, related to COVID-19 that's based on the SEAL team curriculum, and that module should be launching soon. Um, 
our EDGE Center, which is the Center for Exposures, Disease, Genomics, and Environment, um, created videos in nine different languages with information about COVID-19 very early on, um, to, um, specifically making sure that um, some of our vulnerable communities um, in our region have access to um, up-to-date information. Um, PNASH, the Pacific Northwest Agricultural Safety and Health Center, has been providing resources to workers in farming, fishing, and forestry se sectors about how to keep safe. And uh, we have undergraduate students working on a, a range of different COVID-19 projects for the capstones. Just one example um, is some students who are creating podcasts on COVID-19 and how it's affected um, the homeless population, individuals experiencing homelessness here in, uh, in the Puget Sound region. Um, we'll hear more about the work that school has done in the practice community later during um, Janet's presentation. Um, I also want to talk about um, what we've been doing in terms of instruction. So in March, um, as I mentioned, our employees began to work remotely um, and the university switched all of its courses online for the final two weeks of winter quarter and then continued that through, uh, has been continuing that through spring quarter. Um, throughout this transition, our faculty and staff have been incredible. They've been, you know, I know people who are outside of academia don't normally associate the words agile or nimble um, with, with academia, but in this case, they really have been um, tremendous in terms of responding in a very short period of time um, and, and, and for many of them taking up a completely new modality of instruction. And Stephanie will tell you a little bit about some lessons learned there. Um, and our students have been remarkably resilient. This is such a hard time for many of them. Um, besides the things that we're all going through in terms of social isolation um, due to social distancing measures, um, many of them are experiencing economic hardships um, and just angst about what's going to happen, um, particularly those who are just about to graduate from either undergraduate or graduate programs. Um, so, you know, our hearts go out to them. We're doing what we can to support them, and we appreciate all of you who have um, donated to help support them as well. Um, without any question, um, if COVID-19 has uh, proved anything, it's that we need a highly trained and agile public health workforce. Um, our school is a critical and vital component of the public health infrastructure that keeps our communities safe and healthy through the production of this workforce. And you'll hear more from Stephanie about what's been going on um, in terms of education in her presentation in a little bit. Um, finally, turning to research, um, our faculty have done just a great job, again, of just shifting on a dime um, to be responsive to what are the research needs and what, that we um, have to try and figure out um, how we can better contain um, and treat and prevent COVID-19 infections. Um, and, and also looking at impacts on um, vulnerable communities as well. Um, so we'll hear much more about this from uh, Lisa Manhart, but um, the range of work activities is, is truly diverse. Um, for those of you who had one of those horrible, um, like high up in your nose, nasal swabs, you'll be grateful to the folks um, here who did um, really landmark studies showing that you could get just as good of results doing lower part of the nose swabbing. So um, you can. Those of us who didn't get swabbed earlier can look forward to less invasive swabbing um, going forward. Um, we've had tons of people working on uh, development of statistical models to track the spread, some of which have been in the news. Others have been a little bit more behind the scenes, but have been uh, just as valuable, and if not more so, you don't, we don't always see um, the, the pipeline um, through the papers, but um, a lot of our modelers have been working with the Department of Health and the governor's office to help inform the decisions that are made there in terms of next steps. Um, we have great teams working on evaluation of therapeutics and vaccines, people looking at the impact of the disease on vulnerable social populations, and also developing uh, workplace safety protocols, which we're all excited about maybe getting to use sometime soon. Um, and then, um, I, I should also mention, so lots of grant dollars coming in um, as a result of initiatives to fund um, some of these just-in-time um, requirements. Um, 
a small subset of those were funded through the University of Washington's Population Health Initiative. Um, so nine of those um, new pilot grants for COVID-19 um, involve faculty from the School of Public Health. Um, and they range from topics like how the pandemic has impacted food security and access um, to studying racial and geographic disparities in COVID-19 testing and deaths in, in King County. Um, so, like I said, we'll hear more details about that in a moment from Lisa. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about what we can expect going forward. Um, so, as of right now, uh, UW plans to hold in-person classes next fall. Um, but we are readily acknowledging it will not be business as usual. Um, at the very least, we expect probably that um, the big classes will probably need to have the lecture portion um, done online. And, um, and we're, but we're still hoping that uh, we'll be able to um, have some of our smaller classes and discussion sections be in person. Um, that being said, we know that we're not in charge of what happens and that there could be um, a resurgence of cases. Um, we expect that we're still gonna see members of our community um, being, becoming infected and needing to self-isolate. So making sure that we're offering options for everybody is gonna be really critical. And it's gonna be another heavy lift for our faculty. It's even more complicated to teach in, in both modalities online and in person than it is to completely switch over to online. Um, in terms of budget issues, um, we expect a loss of funding across the university, big loss in revenue, particularly around housing, food services, and athletics, um, as well as um, I'm sure you've heard for the health system, big losses um, due to restrictions around elective procedures. Um, and we've also heard that the state is projecting a $7 billion loss um, and revenue over the next three years, um, since we do get, obviously, revenue from this, um, get funding from the state um, that covers um, some of our expenses, that obviously is going to impact us as well. So in anticipation of that, uh, we have entered campus-wide into a period of restricted hiring. Um, so hiring of non-essential staff has been suspended. Um, and then um, we have restrictions in terms of faculty hiring, um, that will be in place at least through the upcoming um, academic year. Um, that doesn't mean no hiring though. So we are still putting in a request to the provost um, to hire some new faculty for next year. And I do wanna give a shout out to, we had a really successful year this last year and a bunch of new people who started. Um, so uh, we're actually in really good shape in terms of having a nice bumper crop of, of new faculty um, that we can focus on um, mentoring and and keeping happy, um, even though we're not gonna be spending quite as much time doing, a cer doing searching in the next year. Um, overall, um, particularly compared to some of the other schools that are dependent upon clinical revenues, um, School of Public Health is pretty well positioned. Um, we haven't seen so far any decrease in enrollments um, compared to say College of Arts and Sciences, which has seen some. Um, that's important for us because that's another um, big source of revenue for us. Um, so anyway, you know, could be worse. Um, so we're trying to sit, look on the bright side of that and make sure that we plan appropriately. Finally, I just wanted to mention um, that we are having an online graduation celebration this year. Um, the campus as a whole, because of obvious restrictions on social gatherings, um, will be having the big ceremony will be online, but we also in the School of Public Health We'll have our own celebration be online. That'll be at 11 a.m. on Sunday, June 14th. And I'm excited to announce that our celebration speaker is former EPA administrator, Gina McCarthy, um, who if you haven't heard her speak before, she's fantastic, super funny, um, and just really eloquent. And uh, Gina currently works for the NRDC, the National Resources uh, Defense Council. Anyway, we're, we're thrilled um, that she's going to be with us and uh, for those of you who are worried about that our students aren't going to get to march across the stage, stage um, please be aware that we're sad for them too, obviously, and we're trying to make the online be as, as cool as it can be. We have a pretty cool um, platform, um, but they also will be invited to come back next year um, to participate live in graduation if they want to. So with that, whew, big update. 
I'm going to turn it over to Janet and let her tell you some of the exciting news about what's been going on in terms of public health practice. Janet. Thank you, Hillary. I'm going to show some slides. Can you see them? Awesome. All right. Hello, everybody. I'm going to spend a few minutes uh, talking about some of our public health practice engaged activities uh, around our COVID response. So this first slide is just a list of the different agencies that um, folks from our school have been engaged with. You can see um, several local health departments listed, several um, state agencies, including our Department of Health and Labor and Industries, our very own uh, Campus Environmental Health and Safety uh, Organization, and then there's a little bit of a catch-all at the bottom because uh, there are, in fact, uh, too many total organizations to list that we have been engaged with um, around COVID response. So Hillary mentioned that I run a program called the, the SEAL Team Program. I wanted to start there because these were kind of the first responders um, when COVID uh, first struck our area. Um, but the program itself has been around for five years and um, I created it to provide students the opportunity to take the lessons they were learning in the classroom out of the classroom um, in order to provide support to public health practice agencies around disease surveillance and outbreak response activities. And over the years, we've had mumps outbreaks and there was a big Zika summer and we had measles last year and foodborne outbreaks all of the time and standing up new surveillance systems and the SEALs have been involved in all of those things. Um, yet here we are uh, in the middle of the outbreak of all of our lifetimes, um, a global pandemic and um, the SEAL program. This is just to say the program was not created for this, uh, but it was almost seems like it was created for this. So um, the image on the left uh, is showing uh, just a picture from an article that was written by UW Media and came out in, in UW Today about two weeks ago about the SEAL's response. And the image on the right um, was actually a photo taken uh, by somebody from the Associated Press. And on the left there is uh, the SEAL student Erica Foytz and a public health nurse, Jennifer Morgan from Public Health Seattle King County. And Erica's picture has now been all over uh, the news and various outlets uh, because of her, her early work. So I thought the way I would like to just kind of uh, talk about what, what we have done as a school is by kind of superimposing some of the key activities on top of the epi curve uh, for uh, COVID cases, this is the epi curve for the state of Washington uh, from last week uh, when I was putting these slides together. So uh, if you can remember back to January 31st, and I'll confess that it's hard for me these days uh, because it seems like a very long time ago now, um, that was a Friday and it was the day that the president announced uh, travel restrictions from Hubei province in China and that was the day I got the first call from a colleague at the state health department saying, you know, we are, you know, we may need some help. And that Sunday, um, two days later, we had already also been in touch with um, colleagues at uh, Public Health Seattle King County about how we may be able to help out with this early phase of symptom watch activity um, and and early February, um, our SEAL students were, were on the ground starting to train at Public Health Seattle King County, helping out with those early symptom monitoring calls and uh, a, a task that involved, evolved into support for their early case and contact investigation work with those early cases in King County. By late February, the SEALs were on the ground at the State Health Department getting trained on their laboratory uh, information management system so that they could help with the um, influx of laboratory um, um, tests and samples needing to be tested at the state public health lab. So the SEALs were there helping with that for, uh, for, for many weeks. Um, as, we, as we got into March, uh, Public Health Seattle and King County was requesting um, quite a, a, a larger uh, response from our folks because you could see on the curve that the number of cases was in increasing quite a bit at that time 
And in addition to the SEAL students, I recruited students from all across the school, uh, and in addition to some faculty and staff who were willing to come in um, on, a, on a moment's notice to help support our county health department uh, with, their, um, with their data and analysis needs. And then in late March, uh, we got a call for a couple of the SEAL students to help out with stand up of a new drive through testing site in Tacoma Pierce. And in addition, <clears throat> some folks from our Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences were helping out the Washington State Labor and Industries folks with testing alternative materials for face masks, in addition to doing some consulting on how to do disinfection and risk reduction, particularly in workplaces. By early April, the case investigation work that had been done at uh, King County was transitioned to the State Health Department. And along with that transition, our SEAL students transitioned with that work to help out at the uh, Shoreline Office of the State Health Department uh, as they transitioned their case investigation work from a paper-based system to an electronic system. And then around the same time, we received a request to have our SEAL students help out on our own campus public health agency um, with uh, their COVID-related uh, response activities. And then here we are uh, kind of at the present and I've lumped a bunch of things together because these are all ongoing activities now, um, starting late April to early May. Um, we've been engaging in uh, various data analysis support activities with our colleagues at the state. Uh, as Hillary mentioned, uh, the SEALs along with the Northwest Center for Public Health Practice are working on developing a contact tracing training We've been helping out at the state with some qual quality control for their case and contact investigation uh, protocols that they've stood up. And we've also helped out very recently with um, a consultant for the Department of Corrections who asked uh, for a little bit of help in figuring out uh, how to activate testing within jail populations. So I'll conclude just with a few more images uh, to give a shout out to our folks who have been on the ground um, at these agencies doing this work. At the top, we have uh, Marty Cohen from DEOHS um, in whose lab a lot of the um, alternative fabrics testing was, uh, was conducted. And then along the bottom, a group of the SEAL students. Um, uh, these are pictures um, that, that I took myself um, during their uh, case investigation work uh, with Public Health Seattle and King County, and then at their um, laboratory uh, um, information systems training that they did uh, with our uh, state colleagues at the State Health Department. Um, we're just incredibly proud to um, have helped to this point uh, so much and looking forward to contributing our um, expertise uh, in whatever ways are necessary in the coming phases. Thank you. All righty, so um, it sounds like I've sort of messed up the order of things a little bit. Oh, Lisa's ready, yay! Um, okay, so um, our next uh, panelist is Lisa Manhart, who's their Associate Dean for Research and also Professor of Epidemiology and uh, Adjunct in Global Health. Uh-oh, we lost your screen, Lisa. Hello, yes, I, uh, I didn't realize that I couldn't unmute my microphone until okay. I took the slides down. So here they come okay. again. <laughs> uh, still learning all of the Zoom webinar tricks here. Um, thank you, Hillary. I'm actually delighted to be here um, and to have the opportunity to tell you just a few more details about some of the really exciting and interesting research that our faculty um, staff and students are doing uh, related to COVID and a little bit um, just about research in general and how it has been impacted by the pandemic. Okay, and now my slides, there we go. Um, so uh, Hillary gave you, a, I think, a really nice summary of much of the research that's being done um, in our school. 
This slide um, actually violates all principles of appropriate PowerPoint slides. Um, it's very busy, um, and I apologize for that. I, I really struggled uh, picking out which studies to kind of put up here and give you an overview on, and this is really only a smattering uh, of what people are doing. Um, so I'll just give you a few more details on a couple of the things that people are doing. Um, the first set of uh, studies uh, up here on the left hand side, the COVID-19 PEP study and the COVID-19 treatment study um, are some really fascinating parallel studies that many of you may have read about in the Seattle Times um, over the weekend. The PEP study is testing whether or not you can use a medication, hydroxychloroquine, to prevent infection uh, from someone who has been exposed to COVID-19 disease. Uh, the COVID-19 treatment study um, is looking at the other side of that equation. How effective is this drug, hydroxychloroquine, with or without an antibiotic, azithromycin, at actually treating people who are infected with the coronavirus and have COVID-19 disease? Um, the PUP study is being led by Ruan Barnabas, and the treatment study is being led by Jared Baton and Christine Johnston. Um, and for those of you who had a chance to look at the article in the paper, they are actually struggling a little bit with recruitment. Um, and that struggle is not because there aren't enough people with COVID-19. It's because people are now very concerned about adverse effects of these uh, of this drug, hydroxychloroquine. Um, the good news is that very low doses are being tested in these studies, and so um, the safety to patients is actually um, very well monitored. Um, our START Center, um, which is a group of students who provide consulting type services to uh, public health agencies, um, as well as to non-governmental organizations, uh, such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Uh, they have been tasked with um, providing some policy advice for the government of India during their um, lockdown period. Uh, many of us have pets, um, and there has been a lot of buzz in the news about whether uh, the coronavirus can be transmitted between pets and, and their owners. And Peter Rubinowitz in uh, the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health Sciences uh, group is looking at this, sampling actually the pets of uh, persons who have been infected with the virus. Hillary mentioned this fabulous self-sampling method that Jerry Cangelosi in DEOHS has developed. Marissa Baker in our, again, in our environmental and occupational health sciences department is looking at the impact on workers, um, particularly those who find it very difficult to work from home. It's quite easy for me to do my work um, from my cozy little spot here, but Uber drivers, people who work in retail, people who work as servers in restaurants really can't do that. Um, Judd Walson, uh, is looking at the effects on very vulnerable populations in Africa, leveraging a network of nine sites with laboratory and data infrastructure. Um, Catherine Peebles and Ruan Barnabas developed a fabulous model um, with that oscillating curve there uh, that you see, which really describes what is anticipated to occur as we kind of go in and out of these social distancing restrictions. And then finally, Tom Fleming, who is a, a very um, esteemed biostatistician in our Department of Biostatistics, has worked with uh, some colleagues in the World Health Organization, developing some streamlined protocols for clinical trials um, that are being used now in all of these tests of novel therapies and vaccines. Uh, Hillary also mentioned the Population Health Initiative COVID-19 Rapid Response Grants. Um, there were, as she mentioned, nine of them that involved uh, school public health personnel. Six of them uh, were led by school of public health uh, faculty members. Um, the bottom set of about four um, really address the um, racial and ethnic health disparities that we're seeing 
um, in COVID-19, one of which uh, is being led by our own Stephanie Farquhar, who you'll be hearing uh, from in a moment. She has a project looking at disparities in access to COVID-19 testing and then health disparities in outcomes of the disease. Uh, Steve Mooney in the Department of Epidemiology is uh, collaborating with other data scientists across campus and using some machine learning approaches on our electronic medical records uh, to see if we can optimize things as patients come into the healthcare system. And then Scott Meschke is looking at environmental surveillance methods, um, working on identifying where this virus is actually hanging out and how can we uh, get rid of it in the environment and reduce transmission. Um, so that's just, as, as I said, a smattering of the COVID-19 related research that um, people in the school are involved in. There's also a lot of non-COVID-19 research, all of that work that we were all doing before um, the SARS coronavirus 2 came on the scene. That was for the most part halted. Um, our human subjects division uh, halted all in-person human subjects research on March 19th, with a few exceptions. Um, the result of that has been that much of the research that um, people in the School of Public Health normally conduct has had to halt. Um, the good news is that um, along with the governor's a phased plan to reopen the state of Washington. Um, restrictions on human subjects uh, research are beginning to relax. Um, this is just the little highlight of phase two of the governor's plan and we expect during that time that uh, we'll begin uh, re-engaging in some very safe uh, in-person human subjects research. Um, so that's really exciting for a lot of our researchers. Um, some of our researchers, as you have seen, were quite able to rapidly pivot and transition their research to looking at COVID-19 and impacts. Um, but another of individuals really are still waiting uh, for the opportunity to resume their work. And that is um, another aspect of the economic implications of uh, COVID-19. It's also um, going to hit uh, the research community um, and we have been very active in uh, lobbying uh, for additional parts of the uh, surplus, or sorry, um, the bill, the congressional bills that um, are designed to mitigate some of these impacts. So I'll stop there and happy to answer any questions about research. I think maybe we'll go to Stephanie next, and then we'll do questions all at the end, if that's okay, Lisa. Thank you. Um, so next up, we have Stephanie Farquhar. Again, Stephanie is our Acting um, Assistant, uh, Associate Dean for Education, um, and also a faculty member in both um, Health Services and DEOHS. Stephanie. Thank you, appreciate it. Here comes my screen. You'll give me the signal if you can see it. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Janet. So um, I really appreciate being here. I just quickly wanted to introduce myself beyond sort of the original setup and title. Um, I have to make a selfless plug that I'm from Longview, so I'm a quick two-hour drive down I-5. That's where I was born and raised, and I did my bachelor's degree in medical anthropology many years ago at the University of Washington. So I have pretty significant roots here and I'm also an alum like many of you on the line uh, this evening. So this photo is a photo of the public health, global health undergraduate class with about 150 students in attendance. And this has become our, our, our new reality um, in teaching. And I just wanted to give you an idea of the scope of what it took to move us from in-person to online this term. Um, so just to share some quick numbers, uh, the School of Public Health faculty are teaching 210 courses this spring term and we were able to move 
all of the scheduled courses online, which was a huge feat. We have about 1,800 public health students who are enrolled in those courses currently, half, roughly half and half undergraduate students um, and graduate students. And Hillary mentioned our June 14th um, commencement plan or celebration plan, and that will involve 731 public health students graduating this term as the class of 2020. So again, about one half of those are undergraduate and the other half are graduate students. So when we woke up to this reality that we were going to have to move all of our classes from in-person to online, we very quickly moved into logistics mode. And by that, I mean, in just a couple of days, we pulled together a survey that we then sent out to all of the School of Public Health spring term instructors and many of our students to ask, are you prepared to teach and learn remotely? Specifically, we asked, do you have the necessary tech requirements? Do you have a laptop? Do you have adequate bandwidth? Do you have a camera and a microphone? Do you have quiet space where you can work? And we found that most of our faculty and students were in fact mostly materially or technologically prepared. And if they weren't, we worked with individual students or faculty to get the adequate bandwidth or to rent a laptop through the UW Technology Loans Program. Um, what we also learned was that the bigger challenges extended beyond technology. It included for our students, for example, um, financial emergency from losing work steady wages or someone in their family perhaps lost their job. Um, we discovered that some of our students felt unsafe or uncomfortable about being back at home. There were mental health challenges um, with the experience of resurrected historical trauma. They felt disconnected and perhaps isolated from um, the stay home, stay healthy orders. So our faculty also had their own challenges, including having young children at home or having stressed partners and so forth. So some of these challenges weren't necessarily new, but they were certainly amplified and they became more urgent in the face of the pandemic. So we fast forward now to week seven of our 10 week academic term. So we're well over halfway into spring quarter. And I would say that we all mostly agree that teaching and learning remotely isn't necessarily worse or better than meeting face-to-face, -face. it's just different. And it requires some different strategies. Um, so I'm going to share with you a few of our strategies and sometimes we like to organize our strategies into categories. So that's what we have done here. So I have four categories, predictability, flexibility, connection, and empowerment. Um, so predictability, most importantly, we discovered that holding class at the time that it was scheduled for and asking students to show up um, was actually a good thing. Uh, to have a schedule and have some structure in this sort of um, age of the unknown gives us a reason to have to get up and show up and is actually beneficial to our mental health. So we, many of us tried to hold our class at the time that it was scheduled for and we conducted all of our classes, as I said, um, at the same time and with the scheduled instructors doing the teaching. The second priority for our teaching was flexibility. So we have um, this thing that we call synchronous versus asynchronous options. That is, we have times where all students meet together online and where some of the learning happens um, at whatever time is convenient for the students. So if some of us are teaching at 8.30 in the morning and most of our students log in, we then record the lecture so that others can listen in later if they need to. And that flexibility is really important for students who may have challenging situations, unable to find a quiet space, um, needing to, to tend to family members and so forth. Um, our other uh, achievement in flexibility is that the dissertations and thesis defenses were moved online. So I actually have one on my calendar for June 9th, I believe. Um, and rather than postponing these and postponing our students' graduation um, until we could all meet in person, we were able to move these really important monumental um, um, degree required defenses online. The third item, and maybe argu arguably the most important, is the ability to still connect um, among instructors, instructors and the teaching assistants, and then instructors and our, our students. So 
one thing that we discovered was really important is to still hold remote office hours um, so that our students can log in and meet with us just as they would if we were sitting in our office or to log into Zoom early before class or to linger after class so that we could hand answer questions and connect with our students. Um, we've also found a way to uh, use the technology in our favor. So during class time, we'll have breakout rooms. I could send you all, I think I could as a co-host, I could send all of you into breakout rooms. So, you know, each three or four of you would be in your own separate room and you'd have to talk about which aspects of this town hall you enjoyed most, for example. And then you'd all come back together, we'd all share our stories. Um, in poll, use polling questions, P-O-L-L, -L, polling questions. I can have students raise their hands. They can drop ideas into the chat box. So there, there's a way, um, there's a necessity to keep everybody hooked and engaged because it's really easy to check out um, when you're behind a computer screen. And then finally, the fourth priority was that of empowerment. And that was figuring out a way to really pull students back into decision-making around the class. This was a huge change for all of us. So we wanted to make sure that we asked students to help make decisions about class content and format. For example, I use in my class of about 100 um, students a, a post-class particip participation survey to check in with students and ask them what else they'd like to know, ask their input on how this new online experience is, is going, ideas that they have for us. Um, and then we did something that was sort of unprecedented where we had a mid-quarter evaluation, the entire campus, so that we could ask about effectiveness of online learning um, for our students. So predictability, flexibility, connection, and empowerment. Now, finally, I wanted to share um, a, a more specific example about one of our courses, and that is our capstone courses. And these are really critical to our public health, um, completion of our public health degrees. And capstone courses are when students receive academic credit to work in a community-based or a public health setting. And this course, like all of the others, had to be adapted to meet the COVID-19 social distancing requirements. So we were faced with the question, what do you do when students can't work inside a community-based organization or at a public health agency? What do you do when they can't be on site? And what does this mean if this is a requirement? For, for their graduation. So we had many clever and creative teams working on this issue in a variety of different degrees and classes um, to develop virtual, essentially virtual community-based learning opportunities. And I'm just gonna share two examples from our public health, global health undergraduate program um, for our graduate seniors. And what you're seeing here on the screen, on the left-hand side of that little tiny box are where the planned capstone experiences for our students. Um, and on the right, after adjustment for social distancing requirements, we only had about eight remaining that we could actually carry out. So we had to identify alternatives um, to fill in the gap there for, for student experiences. So one experience that you'll see there is the Wing Luke Museum. And we have students working on the COVID-19 exhibit in what's called the New Dialogues Initiative Gallery of the Wing Luke Museum. And this this will open up in early March of, of next year, of 2021. And the project's led by the museum exhibits director and the oral history manager, and then Anjali Ganti, who's the course instructor and her entire teaching team. So I think this is a really fabulous example of students who were trained in April last month on how to conduct oral history interviews to ask Asian and Pacific Islanders about living or working in Seattle's international district during the COVID-19 pandemic. And again, this can be done, this can be done at a distance, right? So students asked about um, stay-at-home orders and its connection to historical trauma as a result of ancestors who were interned during the war, asked questions about frontline grocery workers and healthcare workers at the International Community um, Health Services, uh, impact of social distancing on the international district business owners the issue of xenophobia and what that looked like and how that played out in terms of discrimination and stigma in the international district. Um, and that involves a, a, around 15, maybe 20 students. Um, the second example is with the Department of Health, that's what DOH stands for, the Department of Health Engagement Task Force. And for the second project, students will work with the Community Relations and Equity Center for Public Affairs at the Washington State Department of Health. Um, to learn more about cultural and linguistic um, health information access um, 
So for example, the goal is to find out which languages Department of Health should offer COVID information in and through what communication channels. So for some um, individuals and populations, or, oral communication is a more effective way of, of reaching the community versus a data dashboard um, at a web link. And we know that there are generational differences and regional differences to consider. There are linguistic and cultural differences in how we prefer to get public health information and who we prefer to get that information from. And so the project is desperately needed given the amount of health information that um, we see information and misinformation during this pandemic. And the, um, what makes us a perfect fit for our undergraduate students is that all, nearly all of the students on the project are bicultural and bilingual and interviews are being conducted in Spanish and Tagalog and Somali and Amharic, Khmer, um, traditional Chinese, Farsi and Punjabi. Um, so that's an example of what we're doing inside the classrooms or on Zoom for spring term. And I, I sort of feel like um, we may all collapse at the end of the term, the students, the teaching assistants and the instructors. But the fact is that we're able to teach and, and learn and to care about each other and feel connected. And that, and that for us feels like um, a pretty big victory. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. That was actually, a, that was a lovely um, closing comment and transition into um, our questions. So we're going to turn over to a reminder, we use the Q&A function. So if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A box. Actually related to that, the, the first question, which has been up there for a while was whether or not the University of Washington changed the tuition, specifically lowered it. Um, since it's gone completely online? And the answer is no, um, for all the reasons that Stephanie just articulated. So our costs are the same um, in terms of we, our primary costs for instruction um, for most of our classes are related to um, compensating instructors and TAs, um, and those have not decreased. And so, um, and um, as, you can, as you heard from Stephanie, people have been really stepping up to the plate and um, working really hard to to make it work under less than ideal circumstances and without much lead time. So, um, no, the, the UW has not changed tuition. Um, and I would say overall institutionally, um, our costs actually have gone up. Um, that's less true for us, but definitely true for the, the campus as a whole. Um, we continue to keep our um, residence halls open for those students or international students and couldn't go home, or people who, for whatever reason, this really is their primary residence. Um, that's at a tremendous cost to the university, but something that um, the university felt very strongly was the important thing to do for, for making sure that we're meeting the needs of all of our students. So um, no tuition decreases, sadly. Um, question, uh, next question was, um, regarding assistance to public health practice agencies, this can be one for you, Janet, um, has the school been able to assist in other states in the Northwest, like Alaska or Montana? Um, have you gotten any requests for assistance and do you have a sense of how public health practice is going in those states? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I have not gotten requests for COVID related support from any of our partner states in the Pacific Northwest. Um, last week, I think it was last week, I presented at the Northwest Center's uh, Regional Network Steering Committee meeting um, on some of our response activities. So that's an audience of folks from Alaska, Montana, Oregon, like so the whole Pacific Northwest region. And I, I talked to them about um, what we were doing. They were very interested in setting up similar student response programs. I let them know that we're here to help if, um, if they need support. I think one of the challenges is a lot of the work of public health, um, especially since it in involves personal health information, has not been done remotely, like until now. Um, for a lot of these places. So there really hasn't been an opportunity to do our remote support for this type of work. Um, and so I think that's probably one of the barriers to, um, to asking for help. But strangely, about a month ago, um, somebody from New York 
city asked whether the seals wanted to help out with with uh with their response i was like could you put me on the line with somebody from columbia please so i could talk to them about how to help <laughs> anyway yeah so uh, and as far as the question about um how public health practices going in those other states um you know, I haven't heard anything bad, but you know, but I will say that I, you know, it's hard to know what's going on um, unless you're there. So I can't really um, answer that question uh, from an informed place. Yeah, uh, just to sort of augment what Janet was saying. Obviously, I mean, part of the you didn't mention this, but I'll give you a little props for this. That the training that you're doing with the Northwest Center in terms of um, contact tracing, definitely a part of the objective was to be able to provide training for, for other um, states that we serve through the Northwest Center, but more broadly across the United States in terms of building contact tracing capacity, which I'm sure all of you are hearing in the news, all of the governors are sort of rushing to try and, and build up that capacity. Um, and I actually, I got a call from someone in Alaska who wanted help and I was like, hey, we're here for you. You're in our catchment basin. So, um, so I'm sure Betty probably, because she's in the Northwest Center, we didn't ask her to be on this, but she's probably gotten calls from folks and I'm sure folks are participating. I would say in general, um, our experience has been that, and Janet knows this better than I do because she reminds me about it all the time, that the public health practice people are super swamped. Um, this is an incredibly busy time for all of them. Um, so I've, we don't take them not reaching out as a sign that um, you know everything's fine. Um, we're just trying to not bug people too much by saying, we're here, if you want to help, we're here. We do that periodically, but um, at a certain point, um, we, we are, they know that we're here and we're, and we're available to them. Um, okay, next question was, what are the school and the university doing for students who are facing financial difficulty? Stephanie, do you want to talk about this one? Yes. Um, Great question. We are seeing quite a bit of that. And there are sort of two avenues for seeking financial assistance. There's emergency financial assistance through University of Washington, um, the Emergency Financial Aid Office. And um, once that is, um, once that has been accessed and students find that they still have financial need, we have um, some financial assistance we can provide through the School of Public Health. And we've come up with a system where that's centralized and, and it, um, the requests go through Juanita Ricks and Jalen Smith. If anybody wants specifics, you can email me and I'll send out um, the contact information for you. But we really are seeing, we're trying to distinguish whether it's uh, financial assistance or if it's kind of material assistance that we can provide through computer loan program and so forth. And once we figure out what the actual need is, then we're better able to connect the student to resources. Yeah, I would say that that's a really good point, Stephanie, that there's sort of these two different pools. One is the, the financial assistance, which we're definitely seeing requests from students for. Um, but also just the student affairs folks sort of being there to help students navigate through uh, a lot of complexities, unexpected complexities, and also helping them to advocate um, when particularly those who are having difficulty, this, this staff has been doing and, and faculty who are running programs have been doing a lot of that. I should say, so, um, the, so we have an undergraduate student assistance, emergency assistance fund. Um, which I'm sure Kelsey can put up in the in the chat thing. Um, that is that along with the seals is one of our top fundraising priorities right now. Um, and that for me personally, that was um, that's where I have given in the last couple of weeks, just because I know we have um, a huge number of students who are having very unexpected um, financial crises. And sometimes it's not even a huge amount of money. It's just but they need to sort of get them past um, an, an immediate financial crisis that they're experiencing. Um, yep. So thanks to those who have given to that fund. Um, and to the other funds. Um, okay. Uh, question for Janet. The need for contact tracing is talked about in the press. How does one apply for these opportunities or learn more about them in Washington State? Are they permanent positions, temporary, online, et cetera? Okay, great. Uh, so that's a good question. Um, so um, contact tracing is is very, very um, 
very much in the press all of the time. So every state is doing things differently. Um, within Washington state, the governor has asked the state health department to use the National Guard as um, the contact tracing workforce in addition, as a supplement to the state um, Department of Health folks who may work in areas that have nothing to do with communicable diseases, but will be um, retrained in order to do that. Having said that, the jurisdiction for case and contact investigation work, of which contact tracing is a part, lies with the counties. So the county health departments uh, may or may not use the um, National Guard workforce that the state is just preparing um, in case it is needed. So um, as far as I know, I have not seen any contact tracing jobs posted yet um, in any of the local counties in Washington. In other places, you know, we're hearing about in the news, those jobs have been posted and then the CDC Foundation has posted a job kind of nationally for contact tracers. So that's one place to look in order to see um, what a job description might look like and in order to see where those positions might be available. To the part of the question about whether there are permanent temporary online, um, I will be very surprised if they're um, posted as permanent positions. Usually um, during times of um, supplemental funding to public health for outbreak related work, the health departments tend to hire into, um, oh, what does it stand for, Stephanie, TLT, like temporary limited term, I think is what it stands for. Um, and so, you know, having said that, that temporary could be a year or more, um, that it gets renewed. It's at least six months. Um, and then as far as the online piece, um, in Washington State, we are gearing up for remote um, electronic-based uh, contact tracing infrastructure because it's uncertain, um, as we all know, when anybody will be able to work on site at this time. Okay, here's another one that probably is for you, Janet, but um, if others want to weigh in, feel free. Um, the question is, how is um, our role in COVID-19 different from that in previous pandemic? I mean, my immediate reaction would be, we haven't had a pandemic of this magnitude in the United States for a century. So yeah. what do you, what's your reaction to it? So I, I agree with that instinct. So of the magnitude, that's for sure. So, you know, we haven't had a, a pandemic of this magnitude. H1N1 of 2009 was considered a pandemic. It, it affected a lot of people. Um, and, you know, um, so the SEAL team didn't exist then. Um, you know, I was around then, Lisa was around then, so maybe Lisa could, could chime in also. What I remember as a researcher doing work with King County at the time is that H1N1 was very disruptive <laughs> to the research project that I was doing around communicable disease, you know, epidemiology and risk communication. Um, but I think it was because it was just so focused in that area, working with practice that was touched by H1N1. Um, but, you know, H1N1, which was, everyone was very worried about, um, did not end up being as concerning um, and kind of overwhelming um, to the public health system. Uh, and so I would say, you know, the, just the scope and the scale, I mean, and, you know, Ebola was a big deal and Zika, those weren't pandemics, but, you know, Zika was a big deal. And, but it's just, all of those just pale in comparison to the challenges that we have with this particular pandemic. So I would say it's, you know, I guess this is a long-winded way of saying the same thing that Hillary said, which is that, you know, really can't compare those. <laughs> Lisa, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I would um, make the counterpoint to that, which is some of the things that are the same um, in H1N1 and what's going on now, I think our research um, really much of it has, has been very um, similar to what happened during H1N1. I think that was kind of the 
birth of wide scale mathematical modeling to predict transmission dynamics. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of that work going on during H1N1 and we've learned from it. Um, and I think we're leveraging a lot of what we learned from them. Um, so this is completely different from anything we've seen before, but um, I think we have learned a lot of lessons from some of the other pandemics that we've seen. Yeah, that's a great point. Okay, next question is for Stephanie. Stephanie, what differences did you notice in the effects of online classes for grad students versus undergrads going forward? Are there differences in what is needed for grad students versus undergrad students if future classes will be online? That is what I seek to find out. <laughs> That's an <laughs> excellent question. Um, we, so I think there are, so I teach both undergraduate and graduate, and there are some differences that are very sort of tangible. One is that undergraduate courses tend to be much larger. So teaching 20 to 30 graduate students is different than teaching 150 undergraduates online just by size and, and ability to really connect one on one and to keep everybody engaged. So that's something that we need to think about in teaching technique. Um, assessment tends to be different. Um, we have exams and, and quizzes in undergraduate classes more so than we do in graduate classes where we tend to have large papers or, you know, um, large final papers, for example, or projects. So we have um, figured out ways to still issue exams and, and, and quizzes in undergraduate classes by giving people, you know, a couple of hours to access the quiz online in case there are IT or computer problems. And so they have more time and less stress to complete it in 30 minutes as you would in a face-to-face. And classes tend to be longer in graduate, um, not, not, not all of them, but frequently a graduate seminar is three hours and an undergraduate class is around 80 minutes. So those are just some, you know, really kind of tangible differences where you have to think about how you structure the class. Now, we don't have the data yet on the mid-course evaluation across campus, but part of what we're looking at to see if there are different disciplines or different lengths of classes or differences between undergraduate and graduate to see how people kind of rated their experience quantitatively and qualitatively across campus. So we don't know quite yet, but for sure, I'm certain there are going to be some differences. Um, I'm just, I can't predict exactly what they will be. We have a question from, I, I have to skip to this one because I love her. Um, Maxine Hayes, who's our former state health officer, um, would like to know what whether we're tracking what's being done um, about um, children not getting immunizations because their their parents are worried about, for instance, taking them to the doctor's office for routine care because uh, they, they don't want them to get infected. Do we have anyone who's working on that? Anybody know? I haven't heard of anyone doing that, but I yeah. would be astonished if someone wasn't. Um, okay. So yeah, it is a really good point. Yeah. yeah, I don't know that anyone is doing it here, but I think I saw a study um, on you know like documenting challenges to uh, immunizations, and I was struck. If anybody saw, um, I caught part of um, the, um, the you know Jeff Duchin and Dow Constantine gave a presentation today. And Jeff was talking about like a press, you know, a press conference. And Jeff was trying to encourage people to seek healthcare if they need it. Like, you know, and it's mm -hmm. it's related to the same problem that people have been avoiding, you know, out of fear, and it's understandable. But he was saying, you know, we have the capacity. We don't want people to have their, you know, adverse health outcomes in other areas because they're afraid to seek care because of COVID. Okay, um, back up to the, the top. Um, so we have someone who is asking about um, for the training for contact tracing at the Northwest Center. I know it's not, it's not up yet, um, but where should they keep their eyes peeled for that? Can you maybe put that in the, the chat so that they can find that? Just even just the link to the Northwest Center and their training would be awesome. Um, and an anonymous attendee says, do you think the career outlook for public health graduates is positive, even during this time of high unemployment? So I have my own opinion, but I'd love to hear what you guys think. I think so. Go ahead. I mean, what a great, what a great discipline or practice to be in right now. <laughs> 
Right, and just you know, more practically speaking, the you know funds are flowing to public health agencies right now. Research dollars are flowing to public health research organizations, and will you know continue to for some time. I actually think you know out of all of the sectors um, that it's a um, I'm pretty encouraged that our our grads will um, will get uh, hired in public health. Um, the only thing I worry about is if they're not interested in COVID, <laughs> it might be a little more uh, challenging for a little while. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. So probably need to be flexible. A lot of people at, in practice, even ones who have nothing to do with communicable diseases, are flexing right now to help with the outbreak, and so. I would imagine they would expect new hires to, to do the same. I also could see that, you know, like I agree with you, there's this like huge surge in demand for um, positions. And I think you're right, Janet, to say that they're most likely going to be positions posted as um, limited time positions just because it's so much easier to post that way and quicker. Um, but people should recognize that like that's a great stepping stone into um, a practice position and those even under normal circumstances often develop into um, into permanent positions. So those are those are great opportunities. I could sort of see though in the next couple of months, you know, um, local health departments are pretty swamped with responding to the pandemic. So other than positions that are helping with responding, even if they have the resources, they may not have the bandwidth. And so looking for these opportunities to, to sort of get have interim positions could be really helpful. I don't know, Stephanie, Lisa, yeah. do either of you want to add anything? Yeah, I, I was just, it's interesting that this just came up today as we were looking at um, my course syllabus for next week, we were going to have um, Jillian, who's our undergraduate advi career advisor, come in and give a presentation on how to prep your interview or get ready for interviews and, and think about how to translate your skills into your CV or resume. And some students are feeling like, really, why bother? That's kind of a throwaway session. And we just argue that you need to be ready. And what a great way to feel like you're sort of controlling your, <laughs> you know, your options by getting ready for the interview and, and getting your resume. Because these, op these opportunities come up so quickly and they get filled so quickly. So I still think yeah, I still think there will be a number of opportunities and you just have to keep your eyes open and we'll try to share them and push them out as they come through. So related to that, we had someone ask if we have recommendations for mechanisms that students should look for um, looking for jobs if they're graduating in the next year, whether there are certain websites. Um, and I wanted to remind folks who are our, our current students um, to make sure that you're subscribing to, and I always forget the name of this thing, but there's like a weekly Insider. email that goes out. Yeah, yeah, um, Public Health Insider that lists all of the different job postings that we've heard about. So we all filter them into there. Um, and also um, that ASPPH has been talking about doing across all the schools of public health, doing um, a collaborative job fair. And so definitely keep your eyes peeled for more information about that. Um, do you guys have other suggestions? I think in addition to that, um, you should be talking to your mentors and, and faculty members that you know, because a lot of jobs come about um, and the first you hear about it is word of mouth. And if you let someone else know that you're looking for something when, you know, a prospective employer contacts one of us, we're going to refer the people that we know. Absolutely. Okay. Um, next question. Will the COVID-19 pandemic have an impact on the evolution of the MPH program or on our curriculum more broadly? Um, yeah. How are we thinking this is going to change? Is this going to change the way that we're teaching or have we already taken this into account with the new MPH core or thoughts about that? Stephanie? I believe you're teaching in the new MPH core, correct? Maybe you have correct. thoughts about that or Janet? Yeah, I mean, it's happening. It's happening. It might just be adjusted for the beginning of, you know, the, the first 
the first set of classes. Um, no, I, I don't think it will change. It just some of some of it might need to move online, but the intention is still there. The courses are the same. The instructors are the same. So the degree ultimately will be unchanged. We'll just have to wait and see what happens with fall term before we fully know how to answer that. But nothing is slowing down in that regard. Shannon, anything you want to want to add there? Well, so I wasn't sure I mean, if the questions about how it changes our curriculum, you know, I think that, you know, I think that probably we'll be drawing a lot more cases, you know, as a teacher, um, you know, it's like students connect with with things that are relevant to their experience. And the fact that we're all going through this experience right now, I think, you know, at the instructor level, I don't think it's going to change what classes we we should be teaching. But I think, you know, kind of the examples and cases within those classes will probably be influenced by COVID. Well, the one thing that we have been talking about is like doing some training for all health science professional students around contact tracing or just generally sort of upping the general knowledge across the health science schools in the short term about um, working with practice partners and sort of getting them ready. So in case we have another um, surge of cases that that maybe we'll be we could be there and ready to jump in. Well, that's not for education purposes. That's to put them to work, Hillary. <laughs> <laughs> like immediately, we may need True. help. <laughs> one and the same. One and the same. Um, okay. Uh, we have a couple more minutes. Okay, one is someone, an uh, anonymous attendee says, um, I'm astounded by the lack of understanding um, that some people in the general public and longtime healthcare providers I've encountered have in basic public health concepts. Can anything more be done to better inform people? I would have thought that the constant coverage of COVID-19 in the news would have been sufficient, but apparently not. Perhaps we should expect there to be a certain level of ignorance or resistance to learn among people regardless of how many educational opportunities or sources of information are made available. So I would just like to give a shout out to like every single faculty member that I know in the School of Public Health, but definitely all the people who are here, uh, Judith Wasserheide, um, Peter Rabinowitz, Jared Baton, um, tons of people who have spent inordinate amounts of time really just like giving their time to talking to the media to try and make sure that the messaging that gets out um, is as science-based and evidence-based as possible. And, and we are really trying pretty hard to like sneak in our little public health concepts um, and core concepts whenever we can into those conversations. So um, at least know that we're, we're, we're trying as hard as we can. I think, you know, part of the issue in terms of public uptake of that information um, is something that even those of us who um, are well indoctrinated into the subject appreciate, which is just this sort of tsunami of information and information overload. Um, and that's hard for all of us, but if you aren't sure how to distinguish between reputable and non-reputable sources um, through social media or whatever, it just makes it that much more challenging to sift through everything. And then I would say the other big factor is a lot of people are just emotionally and psychologically overwhelmed. Um, so, you know, like I, I point to my, my own kid where, you know, early on there was one point when I was like, do you want to talk about this? And he was like, no. Mm -mm. And every once in a while he'll ask me a question, but most of the time he's like, yeah, I, you know, I, he gets enough of it. He knows what's going on because he, he reports back to me sort of about news stories, so I know he's following what's going on. But most of the time he's like, yeah, no, that's too scary. I don't want to talk about that right now. And I think you know, he's probably representative of a lot of people out there as like, um, you know, there's a, it's a lot to deal with. Um, and, you know, our messages are not always super happy. You know, like we, you know, the public health folks are the people who have been like, hey, modeling shows we're going to be in this for the long haul. Those aren't necessarily messages people want to hear. So, yeah, there are challenges. It's, it's really, I would say, um, testing our capabilities as communicators. Um, and uh, at least for me, I feel like I've been really working uh, in recent weeks on upping my game on one, one of my colleagues called public pedagogy or educating the general public. 
um, but there's it's a different skill set than than educating our our students or um, you know the or fellow researchers. So, yeah, it's it's challenging. Um, and finally, we have one last question in our in our two minutes, but and this is a, a doozy of a question. Do you think that that a silver lining of the pandemic will be that Washington's sky high rate of anti vaxxers will finally drop? Panelists? What do you think? What's your prediction there? So I'll, I'll start. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, a, a group of us started thinking like, if a vaccine becomes available for COVID, we need to start thinking about um, how we would distribute it. And, we, and it's better to start thinking about it now, right? Um, because, you know, the sooner we have all those plans in place, the sooner we'll be able to get everybody vaccinated. And then the other, the next thing that was brought up immediately was, how are we going to message around the COVID vaccine so that people will actually get the vaccine? So, like, I'm a pretty optimistic person, <laughs> but, um, you know, like the evidence that I have before me, and, you know, we're doing evidence-based stuff, like, suggests that it's probably going to be the same challenge that we have even with a COVID vaccine. So, um, so I'm going to say, mm, I hope that you're right. <laughs> Anyone else want to add anything to that? I would just add that um, someone said to me the other day, well, at least you in Washington state, you're, you don't have that problem with all of the anti-vaxxers. <laughs> Which I take to mean it's going to be hard here and it's probably going to be hard, harder in other places. Um, and I think the evidence yeah. of it is, you know, people protesting um, to open things back up in huge crowds. It's the same uh, two, two sides, two different sides of the same coin, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I, re I read about a, a statistics, um, a statistic in the New York Times about New York and they did a a pretty um, not informal, but not incredibly formal and scientific, but poll, and they guessed that 30% of the population at this point was not pro COVID vaccine. Hmm. So I think it's going to be, I'm also optimistic, but I think it's going to be, it's definitely something that it'll keep public health busy and many of our new graduates employed working on this. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Um, so we are out of time, um, but Thank you all, um, both our panelists, for um, showing up today and doing what you do and communicating. And, and um, thanks for everything that you've done behind the scenes to, um, to make, keep us functioning here at the UW School of Public Health um, and to extend our impact. And thanks to everyone who joined us. Um, we look forward to hearing from you. Um, I probably speak for everybody. Feel free to email, email us if you have questions. Um, really do want to hear your stories, particularly alumni, about stuff that you're doing. Um, so, you know, please do share those. We'd love to highlight those. Um, and uh, I just will put in a little pitch for we do have a weekly webinar um, for the school that's Wednesdays 2.30 to 4. Um, and you guys are welcome to join that if you want to. Um, we usually get a different guest speaker each week and do a little topic. So, um, but just more updates. So, anyway. Um, thanks, everybody. Stay safe. Stay well. I guess my final parting words to you are practice good public health and uh, maintain social distancing. Wash your hands. Wear your face coverings. We just got out messaging from Jeff Duchin and pub from Public Health Seattle and King County. Wear your face mask when you can't social distance. Um, and stay well. Stay healthy. Bye.